Welcome to episode 36 of the Non-Fungibles podcast. I'm Luke. And I am George. Today we chat to David Lukacs of Liquid Avatar and Oasis Digital Studios. We learn about David's approach to digital identity and how he is pairing real-life identity with online identity. This is a fascinating conversation and we challenge David on permissioned versus permissionless virtual worlds. We had to respect our time restrictions, but there is certainly more conversation to be had around the idea of not wanting your children to be let loose in a virtual world where identities aren't verified. For us, this raises many questions about whether it's even possible to have an open virtual world with a functioning economy, with NFTs and a decentralized currency, whilst also allowing children to have access. Let us know what you think, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Non-Fun Gerbils podcast, the show about digitally scarce gerbils, non-fungible assets, and the growing decentralized economy. We are the Okay, so David, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me today. It, it's a pleasure. Uh, maybe we could start things off a little bit by you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be here. Sure. Well, you know, it's a it's a background that spans almost forty years, and I started in the tech industry in the mid nineteen eighties, and by the mid nineteen nineties, I was looking at the internet as this newfangled thing that came out, and uh, wanted to create uh, one of the first internet malls in Canada, but Unfortunately, nobody could buy anything online because the banks weren't supporting online purchasing. And it's hard to remember a time where you couldn't purchase something online. So not wanting to take no for an answer, we developed technology that allowed Canadians to type in their credit card and do packet transfer. And, you know, that's been updated subsequently over the years. But we were sort of pioneers in the online commerce or e-commerce business. And I left the industry shortly thereafter, after 2000, just before the tech wreck. Took some time off to support nonprofit organizations and then came back in the, you know, around 2005, developed an incubator, one of Canada's first incubators, and developed some really cool technology that involved artificial intelligence and machine learning for translation. And it was used for games like Farmville and it was used by Disney and Marvel and Lucasfilms for their online events and uh, interviews. So you could hear Robert Downey Jr.'s voice, but you could see underneath it in text scrolling along translation in 68 languages within two seconds we helped launch bb8 we did the first chats with john wick or canna reeves just some really cool stuff left that to pursue a, a career in the crypto industry i wanted to do crypto consulting but not not traditional consulting but consulting that based on identity and um, compliance because i saw you know that the the world would evolve where people online would have to prove themselves just as easily as they do in the real world and that didn't exist and my whole career has been built on the fact that homer simpson looks for donuts and i look for holes although i do like a good donut don't get me wrong and at the end of the day you know we landed in digital identity and uh, that led us to liquid avatar and liquid avatar sort of led us to the nft industry so that's how we sort of got here okay great yeah i mean that's that's a seriously long history there so what is Liquid Avatar? Well, Liquid Avatar is a um, digital identity platform that allows consumers to control and manage their digital identity. It takes into account the uh, emerging and existing privacy rules around the world and allows a, a, a consumer to manage their digital identity as easily as they do their physical identity. So whether it's um, um, uh, membership, a driver's license, government ID, we're helping the world digitize that. And that's been accelerated you know, by health concerns around the world and vaccination concerns. But it's way more than that. It's it's all about, can you prove who you are at any time? Can you have a verifiable credential that's tied to your biometrics? And then can you sort those credentials and put them into different, you know, segments that are managed by an avatar? So Liquid Avatar allows you to manage your digital credentials through the use of avatars. This is more of a sort of corporate facing product or is it like something for governments or is it something that maybe a company would use or, or a consumer well there's three players if you think about using a financial card today let's say a debit card there's three players in an ecosystem when a debit card is used there's the holder of the card there is the issuer of the card a financial institution and then there is the verifier the merchant that wants to verify a card digital um, identity works the same way you've got to have a consumer that holds their own identity and they're in control and they manage it. That makes it self-sovereign. And then you have to have an issuer that issued that 
identity credential or access credential or qualification credential. And that could be a bank, could be a government, it could be a membership, it could be a school, it could be anything that would issue an identity access or qualification credential. And then there's a verifier, someone, some organization or some group that wants to ensure that you are you when you're trying to prove that your identity needs to be used or you have access to something or you're qualified to do something. A good example would be a doctor walks into a hospital and needs to prove that they are who they say they are to get privileges. They need to prove they have access through that identity and that they have the qualifications to, let's say, conduct surgery. So there's lots of different ways. You could use it as student ID cards. You could use it to ensure that only you are using your credit card online. You could use it to prove vaccination credentials. Just as you use credentials in the real world, physical credentials, digital credentials can replace that. In the real world, when I want to prove who I am, I pull out my identity card or my passport, which is issued by, as you say, like a, a centralized issuer that has effectively done the KYC, I suppose, over me and issued me this document. And there's a sort of shared trust amongst institutions that a passport, whether it's UK government or an American government, or you know, there's a certain credibility that comes with that. In, in terms of a digital identity, there tends to not be this sense of a sort of central issuer where trust across various players is met. It's more a sort of an emergent identity that comes over time through various processes of verifications. You, you know, proof you were somewhere or or proof you did a particular transaction. In terms of this platform, I'd imagine not about centralized trusted institutions and more about emergent identity over time that you build up through a sort of process of verification. Is, is that about on point? Actually, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> okay. But George, it is a good point. We do have a partner that does consensus trust. So you're talking about consensus of trust. We're talking about trusted centralized source in a lot of cases. So where I am in, in, in Ontario, Canada, where Toronto is located, the Ontario government is going to be issuing digital identity. Australia is already issuing digital birth certificate. So governments and trusted parties are already issuing digital credentials. Um, governments are currently issuing vaccination credentials, but they're paper-based or they're, you know, they're PDF-based. They're going to be moving to trusted credentials. And you can actually have both exist. So if you think about decentralization, you could have, as you've explained, you could have consensus credentials that are supported by some centralized credential or the initial start of the centralized credential. But what we do to support that is also add standard KYC and anti-money laundering provisions, and we add biometrics. And not the biometrics on your phone, the biometrics that are created by you in our system. So in our system, it's only one user, one account. So no one can really fake out the system. So now you're not only dealing with trusted individuals, you're dealing with real individuals. So now, if you take that equation, start putting it into the marketing mix, advertisers, corporations want to engage with people who are real because they're spending far too much money on social media dealing with people who are not real or answering fake comments or answering to bots. So it's not that I'm saying that you're wrong because you're 100 percent right, but we we have to tie the two together. You can't you can't create a decentralized system unless you've sort of and I, I don't want to be put out on a limb here. But unless you, it's supported at, at its anchor point initially by some trusted mechanism. You know, we in our entire business, we don't look at where the politics lie in this equation. We look where the social responsibility lies. Where How does social responsibility come into that as play? So, yes, we can, do, we can use consensus metrics, but primarily we focus on traditional methodology of, of trusted credentials. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, that's super interesting. So there's obviously a lot of, potential concerns that people would have with this sort of system in when you have say Canada taking everyone's identities online and digital there are privacy concerns and and concerns about honeypots for hackers how how have you sort of addressed that and sort of approached that again a good question i mean how many fake driver's licenses are there out there i mean we have a tendency to think what's going to happen digitally but how many people walk into a pub with a fake piece of ID? Fake ID is, is rampant. I think digital identity um, in connection with biometrics is, I, I believe, and that's a personal belief, and I think a corporation would agree with that as well, that it's going to make things easier because you are going to be able to prove that you are you by credentials that you have private keys to and public keys to to share. And, and using the blockchain, we use the blockchain to ensure 
that the credential belongs to the right person and it's been authenticated. It uses it uses W3C and the Trusted Triangle methodology. It uses um, verifiable credentials. We use something called DIDCOM, which is Decentralized Identifier Communications. I mean, it's it's a set of standards that also supports all the privacy concerns and rules set by governments. Uh, one of the one of the again the leading governments to publish a paper on this is actually the Ontario government and set out a set of standards both for privacy and technology that really is encompassing and provides a roadmap where where the industry is going to be going and what's available today. So it isn't it isn't our design. It is a design that is been designed by an industry with open standards that are supported by the technology and privacy standards that are available today. Mm. So how does blockchain play into this? How are you utilizing that and in which blockchain as well? Now you're going to ask me the tough technical questions and I'm and I'm not the technology guy, although I sort of design the technology. I don't actually go to the nascent stuff. If you barrel it all down, we're on IBM's Hyperledger Indie platform. It is not a public blockchain. It's really hard to think about privacy and identity on a public blockchain. That would mean that in some to some extent, any node operator could join and push any identity they wanted into that system. So to some extent, there has to be controls and authentication. You know, the trust triangle ensures that all the players, sim- similar to that financial transaction we talked about earlier, that all the transactions are authenticated and that held on the ledger and all the identities are verified through credentials that are ledger based. So it re- blockchain is inherent to the systems that we deploy. So w- we use blockchain as a service, not as a miner or a sort of a, a DeFi platform. Mm, OK, so. We've got the the real life identity stored digitally or managed digitally. And then, of course, there's the idea of a metaverse and metaverse identities. Is there is there a crossover here? Do, does, can one link into the other? Is that something that you 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 foresee? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, if you go to Ernest Klein's books, Ready Player One, Ready Player Two, I mean, it all starts with the first key is found where Percival goes to school. So if you're going to go to school, you're going to have to prove who you are to go to school. We have to prove who we are to go to school today. No, you know, people just don't walk into school and say, I'm going to take a class, whether they're five or 55. It doesn't really matter. There's a certain level of, of identification. I think that and organizations like MasterCard and Visa are already looking at this, that they want to have some type of credential when you use a credit card online or a debit card online to ensure that you are you. So I think economies for far too long online economies have been supported by the fact that the technology wasn't available to verify an individual. I I don't think you or I could walk into a store today and say, hold on a second. I didn't bring my wallet. I didn't bring my cards. I didn't bring any identity, but I want to buy that $2,000 item in the corner. And I'm just going to rattle off my number to you. Don't do me a favor. Just take it because I know my number and you can take it and you're good. I don't think anybody would accept that transaction. Yet we all buy PCs online and nobody asks us to show us any identity. They just ask us if the card is good and we know some of the basic information, like, you know, my name, my address, my card number, my CCV, CVV number, it's, it's, I'm done. So, but we wouldn't let that happen in the real world. So I think we're used to having anonymity because the technology wasn't there to support it. And if it was there originally to support it, we wouldn't have anonymity today. So I think the metaverse is going to take is one of the first new evolvements that in technology that is going to probably require most people to say that if you want to play, you got to prove who you are. So there's no bad actors. I don't think a company like Facebook could build a metaverse today without taking the same guardianship that they have or have had to put in place and not take it to the metaverse. Interesting. On one side, there's the proof of, you know, you are who you are. On the other side of that, then you have a huge amount of data leaking out from everywhere, you know, every time you give your details to a company to buy on their online website, you you giving your name and your address and your credit card details. And there's the argument that one doesn't need to give those things over um, because they don't need to know all of that. All they need to know is that you have the, the right to buy and the means to buy. And so therefore, what they should get is just the essential information and not all of the this extra metadata that comes with it. So when we when we look at, say, like, a metaverse. I mean, we should probably define that. Do do you want your private details leaking out there and, and spreading out all over the place? How do you overcome that? How how do you maintain some degree of you know control over your data? So so I'm going to use a different example to to explain this because I think it's a great question. But I'm going to say I, I know it's different in, in different places around the world. But if I 
want to qualify to buy a drink in a pub and I look underage, they're going to ask me for some type of identity. Or I want to go into a bar or I want to go into a liquor store. So what do I typically show them? Driving license. What's on the driver's license? My name, my date of birth, my address, and all my private details on that driver's license that I'm holding, handing over to someone else who now, maybe in a blink of an eye, can capture that or, you know, can do whatever they want with it. I'm readily giving them all my private information. We're building right now for a large association of convenience stores. We're building an application that will go well beyond that for, for age verification that all the person has to do is present a QR code. It starts a transaction, tells the store operator by going back to the blockchain, verifying all the credentials, proving that I am who I say I am by, by showing my face to the phone and says I am at age or over the age of majority to be able to buy that item. So which system works better? You're, you're, there's no leakage of data. In, in the metaverse, and if you go back to Ready Player One, first of all, never leaked any of his data, but to have an account, in the metaverse, he had to be proven who he was. So we're taking that same theory. People get very tied up on the fact that there already is all this leakage of data on the internet. We're trying to stop it by bringing this in. By bringing the system in, we're ensuring that personal identifiable information, PII, is not going to leak. That information is going to be under your control with your biometrics in your wallet, which is blockchain control. I don't have access to it. Only you have access to it. You know, you control it. And that public data in which you want to have available will be tied through a credential, a verifiable credential to your private data. So we're actually doing the opposite. We're not allowing data to leak anymore. We're saying those days are over. We're, we're putting in safeguards today to ensure that only the information that I as an individual wish to share, I will share. No one gets anything more. Mm, yeah, no, that's a, it's an excellent example as well, actually, because proof of access rather than proof of identity. Right. So we think of it as identity, access, and qualification. Great. So you mentioned Facebook. Where do you think Facebook sits in the metaverse future? I think, you know, Facebook has, has a wonderful opportunity here to accelerate the metaverse and help a lot of the things that will come to play to get off the ground. So when we think of a metaverse, you know, we think this virtual immersive world and we think about first person gaming, which we're used to, and whether we're console playing or we're playing online games like World of Warcraft. We also think of, you know, AR, augmented reality and virtual reality, which isn't quite there yet on a large scale. There's still some technology leaps that have to be made on, on a wide scale basis. But Facebook has the resources to make a lot of this happen and create infrastructure. The challenge is how relevant is Facebook to Gen Z? And the metaverse is going to be relevant to Gen Z or Gen Z first. I think Facebook has an amazing opportunity to accelerate and to get adoption in the metaverse. Whether they will be the player they, they want to be, one never knows. I guess it depends a bit on the appetite of that, as you say, Gen Z, to enter into a, a new world of advertising. They're used to a current world of, of advertising and in some ways we're numb to it uh, because of the, the product that we get in return. There is a sort of a small but quite loud faction that would probably like to enter a metaverse that didn't know that they like a particular kind of trainers or not. But I guess that's the <laughs> contract you make with the provider of the infrastructure. I guess in our world and the people who listen to this show, we're, we're very much more in the direction of sovereign identity and an open metaverse, I suppose. But at the same time, of course, you cannot ignore just the absolute might of an entity like Facebook to drive this forward. So in a perfect world, it all kind of kicks off and goes big, but there is this open metaverse which allows creators to build and doesn't come after your, your information or potentially allows you to use your information how you see fit to benefit yourself or to benefit the wider community. And I, I feel like we are going in that direction more and more. Your thoughts, I guess, on what essentially I'm describing there is the world of decentralized metaverse and centralized metaverse, if there is such a thing. G give us a thought about those two potential divergent paths. That's interesting because, George, in this case, I absolutely agree with you. So <laughs> a few months ago, we were approached on another project we're working with at our wholly owned sub sub subsidiary of Liquid Avatar called Oasis Digital Studios. We were approached with a project that involved exactly what you're describing, sort of an open metaverse. Now, at its early stage, it's going to be a very 
centralized organization to get it off the ground, but the goal is to become a very decentralized organization. And we just had a call earlier on that today. But we believe in, in, in a much more open metaverse, one where if a brand wants existence in a metaverse, it's going to have to find, find innovative ways to interact with this constituent. So again, one of the examples you just use, trainers, sneakers, whatever you want to call them, basketball shoes. At the end of the day, if I bought a pair of trainers in the real world, one of the incentives a brand might give me is a pair of trainers for my avatar in the digital in in the metaverse. So there's lots of ways to create brand engagement and brand satisfaction without having to have neon lights of advertising. And that goes back to sovereign identity. If you're an individual and a proven individual, then this spillage in a marketing spend is going to be less because you're only dealing with real people. So people can opt in as they choose to engage with your brand as as they wish. And it will be a different relationship than just having data on everyone. You know, if you think about from a brand perspective, it's probably, you know, pray those laws, probably 80, 20, probably 20 percent of of their customers spend, you know, account for 80% of their sales. So all you have to do is start finding a better way to engage that 20% so that they're spending more money. So I wholeheartedly agree. I do not like the idea long-term of a centralized metaverse. I mean, you do need governance and some control factors and rules. Otherwise, it, it does spin out of control. But we're really focused as we bring, we call it aftermath islands, to the table and um, we're expecting by the time the game goes live it will be a decentralized program cool aftermath islands aftermath islands yep as in yeah the aftermath of some horrendous event is this dystopian <laughs> yeah that was that was the whole that was the whole idea you know there was sort of a i call it noah-esque event where the world flooded and and then as the waters receded these islands showed up now the original premise of this idea was pirates took over and they're selling off land to the highest bidder. And we looked at that and said, that's a really cool idea, but how many people are into pirates? We thought of it based on a supply and demand model as well as a thematic model. We've taken the idea, instead of worlds, which we think, you know, that was sort of the Ready Player One ideas, all these different thematic worlds, we've taken thematic islands. Number one, it reduces the landscape. So it's manageable and server instance. Two, we're going to allow people to buy land on thematic islands. And it could be Dino Roar Alley, where it's a Jurassic themed island, or Cyber Island, where it's a futuristic island. There's going to be each phase, and right now we've got nine phases planned. There'll be five new islands come out in each phase that have a theme in them. Then with each phase, there'll also be community islands, and they might be homespun names like Amber Isle and Evergreen Isle or Fernwood Isle. Like that, and that play style will be um, very Sims-oriented. I could, have a, I could have my house, and there's a community, and there might be other things to do in shops and all kinds of great things. Then there's going to be estate islands, and they'll be the smallest island with the fewest number of land patches for sale and, uh, and for acquisition. And that would be in places like Bitcoin Bay or ETH Estates or Doge Hideaway. I mean, it's, it's all based not only in supply and demand, but it also is where do you want your address to be? Each island will have different types of assets that you can place on the island, things you can build, quests you can do. And we're starting to also talk to other metaverses about the opportunity. Can we can we get everybody in the same room to create a multiverse? So there's lots of things going on, but we are much in the throes of launching the first phases of this new concept called Aftermath Islands. And would, would NFTs be at the core of that? I mean, obviously, if you're selling land the, on the blockchain, then that would sort of predicate that kind of thing. But are they sort of baked in from the ground up in terms of not only the land, but avatars, what, what you're wearing? NFTs on the wall. I mean, we've seen some land-based projects like Crypto Voxels, Somnium Space, various others. In terms of like the overall view, is that is that sort of central to the to the whole mechanism? It is absolutely central to the mechanism. It it the the lands will be available as as NFTs initially, and when the platform goes live, they will be turned in, redeemed, and burned for new deedable NFTs. So you could buy if you bought multiple plots of land as a parcel in the initial land sales, you would not be able to subdivide that till the, the platform went live. And then you could turn it in and, and subdivide it. And you could do with what you wish. You could buy, sell, trade, but it all starts as NFTs. That way we know that the wallet holder has that asset and, and they're assured that they have opportunities to do it. It also gives us flexibility in fairness to everyone because you know, there are so many platforms out there to sell NFTs on. So we might find that today, and this has been a problem with NFTs. 
I buy on one platform, but I can't do anything when when I really want to do something with it on another platform. The really cool part is, is while we're starting in a single platform, we could do multi-platforms, but when the platform goes live, we'll be bringing all of those NFTs into one house and exchanging them or, or redeeming them and redeeming them out for a single game-based NFT credential. Why are you creating this? What is the long game and the vision for this particular? Is it, do you call it a game? Is it a virtual world, a, a social platform? It's a virtual world. It will be a virtual world. I call it a platform right now because I like to think of myself and it's really hard to say that you are, but I like to think of myself as, as a bit of a visionary. And as I said at the at the outset, when no one could buy something online, we developed some of that technology. When someone said, you know, you're not going to be able to translate in real time, 68 languages, we did that. Someone said there's, you know, digital identity is something for the next five years. We're already um, in the process of bringing all our products to market on a very, very sophisticated level. So I think the next generational opportunity will be immersive online play, a fully immersive online play. And so we want to be there at the beginning. This We think it's a great place to be. And it fits with my own personal vision as well, which the corporation is, has adopted much of it and great input from our team members to help shape it. But at the end of the day, we don't want to stand alone. We think that it isn't really a metaverse, it's a multiverse. We think other people will want to do other things and we want to be able to be compatible with those other things. As anyone who sees any of the videos I'm in knows I'm, I'm a collector of popular culture items like comic books. And I have to physically take my comic books anywhere I want to go to show someone. But now with, with organizations like some people call it Veeb, some people call it Vivi, whatever you want to call it, I can now, now download digital comic books and I can have a wide range of digital comic books that mirror my, my physical comic books. Now, instead of condition, which is a traditional collector item, I can look at additions and standards. So I think that the opportunity for the virtualization of a world in metaverse gives us other outlets to do things, be educated, create inclusion, do all the things we need to as a society, be socially responsible and entertain at the same time. There's a, there's a certain logical progression here in the sense that if you can create a identity based, a trusted identity layer, and then people come to understand to a degree, I mean, we don't all understand how some of these systems work in the background, but you can build up trust over time. And then, then you, can, you can use that identity standard on the next layer up, which might be a virtual world. Is your, your plan to sort of tie these, these elements together, I, I suspect, in order to, to create the sort of the base layer for the metaverse interaction where everyone kind of knows they're on a level playing field? They kind of know that they're with people who are real because you've all sort of come through the same filter system. Absolutely, yes. I mean, that's. I think that is a for us is is an important item. Again, we want to be socially responsible, and we think that that social responsibility starts with ourselves. If we're if we're ensuring that there is a certain amount of data guardianship and and opportunities for people to know that when they do something in a a virtual world, that bad actors. They never disappear, but are very limited. There's an opportunity to accelerate all types of opportunities quicker, whether it's discovery of new items, new ideas, or new games where everybody can be involved. It doesn't mean that economics don't take over or scarcity doesn't take over. It just means I don't have to look over my shoulder every time I do something online to see if somebody else is watching me or they're, they're trying to steal my thing. So are you going to be, are you going to be t collecting KYC to enter this virtual world? Well, again, it will depend if, if a government is, by that time, if a government has issued digital identity, we don't need to collect KYC. And, and, and frankly, we don't collect KYC. We have third party standardized licensed firms that we deal with that banks and other institutions deal with that manage the KYC for us. We don't retain any of that information. We only want to know that you've been proven that you are you. But this is a worldwide thing. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Uh, several of our firms can do KYC in 180 countries. It's not, it's not an issue. It's not limited to the UK or Canada or the US. You know, when you look at the large institutions that do global banking, know your customer and anti-money laundering, then review, then these are global operations. The other thing which many of your listeners may not know is that there is a rule in place. It's called the travel rule, which basically says anything over $1,000 US that's transferred online through cryptocurrency has to be verified at both ends. Now, not everybody does it yet. Financial Action Task Force, led by the US, has put that in place. 
There's also different interpretations of the Patriot laws. 5,000 euros, 5,000 pounds sterling, 5,000 Canadian dollars, 5,000 US dollars where you, where you have to declare certain things. There's lots of rules already in place. We've just kind of lived in the Wild West, as, as the old uh, US proverb goes, that because there hasn't been identity verification, we've been able to do pretty much whatever we want online. But government services that are more online today, financial services that are more online today, we're not changing the dynamics. We're just at the leadership end of it. So we're not pushing for governments to do that. They're already doing it. We just want to make sure that we can help support it and make sure it's done right. I guess the issue becomes if you're moving in a world wherein there is the opposite of your system. So let's say there is the Wild West. There is, you know, no KYC. The metaverse sort of grows organically out of a sort of cluster of interested parties that want to develop together and produce a free for all, as it were. Is KYC a barrier to entry? It's not a barrier to entry if I want what's on the other side enough. And so I guess what you need to do is produce a world where everyone wants, everyone wants to participate in and get over that barrier to entry that potentially KYC could be, although having said that, you know, a lot of the systems are very easy to use now, versus just sort of you know, going into the Wild West and taking part with sort of no questions asked. Um, I, I imagine those two, again, divergent paths sort of appearing, and I, I get the sense you are on that side. What do you think the benefits are on, on the side of effectively being a permissioned metaverse? And will people jump over that sort of barrier rather than just sort of head off into open metaverse or wild west metaverse well i think there's you've got to temper everything that you do but at the end of the day you know i'm not a parent of a small child but the adoption is going to be through young children too things like roblox and everything else right would you want your children inside a system where no one is verified i i don't i don't know it's a great point great point and the challenge always is we think of ourselves as voters and children don't vote so usually they're the last to, to be heard from um and again i'm not getting political here but to send a child to school in most countries they have to be vaccinated and you have to prove that they're vaccinated yet for an adult to prove that they have a vaccination to keep other adults safe has been the political nightmare for many countries and many or many areas. So it's not about reducing rights. It's about creating, again, we go back to that social responsibility. We're not asking a seven-year-old to prove who they are, but could a parent vouch under data, data guardianship rules that that child is who they say they are and I'm making sure I manage their identity. So there's there's got to be safeguards. There's got to be oversight there's got to be rules but i i truly believe and i could be 100 percent wrong i truly believe that we are quickly moving based on economics to places where those that want to give access to services are going to want to know that you are you so that they don't get burned on a chargeback of their of the credit card therefore we'll adopt it and and if you think about it there's been a lot of examples out there where we don't adopt quickly and then all of a sudden flash okay how many of us use flash anymore nobody right nobody uses flash flash was the major thing but a particular fruit-based technology company um, decided that they weren't going to support flash and while everybody revolted flash disappeared and html5 came into play which everyone adopted so while people are resistant to change once change is beneficial and people can see the benefits, everyone seems to adopt it. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point about where you want your children hanging out. And maybe that's a different place to where you want to hang out. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, people hung out in Second Life. Second Life morphed into what it was, you know, for a long time um, to be very adult oriented. But I think if you look, if we go back to the premise that Gen Z is going to drive this bus and even below Gen Z or Gen Z, you're going to see that people are going to want to come on board and parents are going to want to be assured that their children are safe. And then you've got COPA and, and other you know child protection laws. So we're not, we're again, we're not trying to, to look at the political aspects. We're looking at, I would rather hang out where people are verified. And that's my personal preference, because then I don't have to know that somebody's trying to clip my identity or somebody's trying to take my data. Everybody's been verified and we're all on an equal footing. But some people may, may shy away from that. And and maybe late converts to the to the party, but I think the vast majority um, they're assured that their identity is in their control, 
will probably want to see things that protect their identity and their personal data. Well, I mean, it's a super interesting topic. I'm very aware of we've run out of time. But could you tell us what blockchain um, are you using and when are you releasing as well? We're releasing in early November. We have not decided on the development blockchain yet. That's still to be decided. The first thing is we'll be using a number of different platforms to issue our first NFTs. And as as we said, as we issue our roadmap and we issue uh, our final white paper, all those NFTs will be transferable into the final blockchain. But we are we are looking very carefully at that because there are some really new emerging great blockchains. We know the people at uh, Hedera. That's an amazing, amazing product or, or platform. You know, when you look at at Luna and Terra, there's there's so many great things out there that are happening. We've got a few months to decide what the underpinning blockchain of the metaverse will be. But at this point in time, we're staying fairly agnostic and open on the NFTs because we know we'll redeem those into a single blockchain platform when we bring the product live. And the first pilots are, are tentatively scheduled for mid-2022. Okay, fantastic. And do you have a website for that? Uh, for Aftermath Islands, it's www or aftermathislands.com. And for Liquid Avatar, it's liquidavatartechnologies.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for joining us, David. Super interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. That was that was very interesting. We could have gone on further, of course, but uh, another time. <laughs> uh, always welcome to invite me back. I, I will, I'll be there. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.